Hey there, scary story fanatics. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. With all of us being locked up inside for so long, most of us can't wait to get back into the great outdoors. Well, before you rush yourselves back to camp, think through the implications of your return with a little story that so many of you have been dying to hear. Self-help. The Survivors of Locust Lake. Sarah Clark had recently graduated from Kaplan University with a doctorate in Applied Behavior Analysis when she heard of a group of people up north in Pennsylvania. They had all been affected by a string of murders over the years in and around a little town called Halstead. She saw this as a perfect opportunity to put her skills to work and help a few people in the process. So she bought a little building off the plaza in Halstead and set up shop. She quickly went to work by passing out flyers and spreading her name around, Dr. Sarah Clark. She still wasn't quite used to it. But after a few weeks of getting her name out, she quickly had a small group of people affected by these murders. They all had different accounts of the murders and believed that the murders were committed by at least two different people. But Sarah knew better. She had studied up quite a bit on the subject, and she knew that the real culprit of these murders had been put to death over a year ago. Todd Jacobs had murdered his friends at Locust Lake when he was 16. It was believed that he also killed the owner of the camp at the time. He was locked up in Fairview State Hospital, where he underwent treatment. He believed wholeheartedly that a man in dirty clothing and a stitchwork mask was the one that killed his friends, but in reality, he had just created this boogeyman as a coping mechanism, a scapegoat to take the burden of the things that he had done. He had escaped a few times every dozen years or so, and unfortunately, more bodies turned up at the camp and in the nearby town of Halstead. He was eventually moved to a maximum security prison and then executed, but not before he managed to rack up quite a kill count. There were four people at her first session. Shiloh, a somewhat shorter girl in her early twenties, she had shoulder-length, light brown hair and a bit of an attitude to her. She wasn't mean or anything, but she seemed a bit defensive at times, but she was generally a good person. She had been the only survivor of the massacre at the camp when she was a baby. Her parents and her friends were killed. She later witnessed the death of Amy, the older sister of Joseph, who was also there. He wore a pair of ripped blue jeans and a black shirt with the words Cannibal Corpse written across in bloody letters. He was a young teenager now, but when he was just a child, he witnessed the death of his older sister as she tackled a masked man, believed to be Todd Jacobs, into the river in order to save him and Shiloh. Then, there was Natalie, who was in her late fifties. She seemed like a woman that anyone would love to have as their neighbor. She wore a long, flower-print dress and seemed very proper, but she held a painful secret inside. Her husband, Eric, was the camp owner that had been murdered roughly around the same time that Todd Jacobs had murdered his friends. And finally, the last member of the group was a man named Ray Bob Bruce. He was also in his late fifties. He wore a white, stained tank top. Many would call it a wife beater that clung to a gut that stuck out from the bottom of his classic beer belly. He had barely survived an attack 
the same day as Joseph and Shiloh. Many people were killed at the nearby Rex's bar, and a fire had started in all the chaos. A fire that gave him third-degree burns across both of his arms and a small portion of his face, leaving him with terrible scars and a loss of much of the feeling in his right arm. The group of them sat in a circle, a bit spread out around the room with some empty chairs in between them. Sarah introduced herself and then talked to the small group about how she was there to help them, how she was there to guide them through the grieving process and to allow them to move on in life. It soon came time to where they had the option to talk about themselves and why they were there at the group. Natalie reluctantly stood up and began to tell her story. Hello, my name is Natalie, and around 30 years ago, my husband Eric and I had purchased some property so that we could build a camp on it. The place was beautiful and things were great. Our dreams were coming true before our eyes. Natalie began. But I guess that wasn't meant to be. That, that thing at Locust Lake killed my Eric. I'm, I'm sorry. She said, beginning to become emotional before she sat back down. It's all right, Natalie. That's why we're here. Sarah said. Would anyone else like to share their story? She then asked. Shiloh and Joseph sat there in their seats and remained silent. Sarah could tell that they were obviously uncomfortable with being here and talking about their lives. Raybob then stood up and his large gut stretched out even more from beneath his shirt. Uh, hey, um, I'm Raymond Robert Bruce. But you can call me Ray Bob. Um, over a dozen years ago, I was at Rex's bar over on Main Street with a bunch of my buddies. And, and these two kids come running in, just a screaming. And then this big guy came in through the door behind him. And, and I'm a big guy, but this guy was even bigger than me. But anyways, this guy killed everyone in there. He murdered everyone he could. And, and all the ruckus. A fire broke out, and I got burned pretty bad, as you can see. And I don't have no feeling in my right arm because of it. Then I don't care what none of y'all say. There wasn't no human being. That thing was a monster sent from hell. Ray Bob said, before sitting back down in his chair, a bit worked up over reliving the event. Thank you, Ray Bob. For sharing your story with us. Sarah spoke. Would anyone else like to share with us? She then asked, before looking over at Shiloh and Joseph. My parents were killed when I was a baby at the Locust Lake Massacre. Then I watched Joey's sister take a plunge over the edge of the bridge with that monster Casper Stoical. Shiloh said, somewhat begrudgingly, getting a bit of a glare from Joseph in the process. Those kids are your parents? Ray Bob then spoke. I used to run a little gas station up the road. I remember them coming in that day. Such nice folks. I'm sorry for your loss, girl. He finished. Yeah, thanks. Shiloh replied unenthusiastically. The day continued on with people sharing happier stories of their memories with their loved ones before Dr. Clark wrapped up everything and everyone went home for the day and they would pick up again next week. Sarah locked up her building and made her way back to her car before heading home. She knew she had to separate herself from her patients, but she couldn't help but feel badly for some of them, and the more she thought about it, the more she began to think that maybe she wasn't cut out for this type of work. She's always been a bit of an emotional person and has always felt badly for people in need which is what drove her to start this job to help people in the first place. It affected her so much that she would stay up late over the next few days. She strained herself trying to think of ways to help them. One particular night had her up to nearly four in the morning before she finally went to sleep. 
She woke up very unrested just a few hours later and began her day as usual. She began her morning drive from Binghamton, New York, to her little office in the plaza of Halstead. This time around, she decided to take a different route to work. Since she had moved here, she had not yet been to the site of the many crimes. So instead of driving down the east side of the river to get to Halstead, she drove down the west side of the river, which would also lead to Halstead, but along the way there was a little detour that would lead to the old camp on Locust Lake. The camp that had just closed a couple years prior after another disaster had happened, the last one before Todd Jacobs, was once again found and then soon after, executed. Dr. Clark soon found the road that would lead up to the old camp, and she turned her car off the pavement and onto the dirt road that led up the hill. The overgrown trees along the road seemed to hang over her path, almost creating a tunnel of shadow along her way. She eventually caught sight of the camp. A few old cabins were scattered across one side of the lake, and the burnt remains of what appeared to be a cabin could be seen piled off onto the side. Dr. Clark recalled reading about how several children had burned to death in a cabin, and she knew that this was surely the leftover reminder of that incident. She drove slowly through the camp, and she felt like she knew the place. Everything looked nearly just as it did in the crime scene photos that she had been studying for weeks. As she drove through the camp, she began to notice that the only sound that could be heard was the sound of her car's engine. She had her windows down, and still the only sound was her car. No birds, no wildlife, nothing. There was only silence. Dr. Clark scanned her eyes over the area before she was suddenly frozen in shock. There ahead of her stood a tall man who wore all black. A ragged black coat hung from his shoulders and his face appeared to be covered by a burnt and ripped old t-shirt. Through the rips of the t-shirt, Dr. Clark could see disgusting burned and bloated skin and some pieces of bone that stuck out through the damaged, rotting flesh. The large figure held what appeared to be a blade of a pole saw, which was broken off some distance down the pole to create a shorter handle. Suddenly, the man began sprinting full speed at her. This snapped Sarah out of her trance and she quickly slammed the car into reverse and began peeling away from him. But it was too late. The figure lunged forward and jumped onto the hood of the car, landing upon the metal with both feet and causing a large dent in her hood. Sarah screamed in terror as she looked up at the man blocking out the sun above her, creating a silhouette of terror. The man raised the broken pole saw above his head and stabbed it down forcefully through the window. Sarah screamed and woke up in a panic. She was still safe in her bed in her apartment. She sat up in a cold sweat with her head in her hands and began to try and calm herself down. It had only been a dream, and despite how terrifying it was, she saw it as a good thing. Sarah woke up with an inspiration as to what to do to help her patients. The best way for one to overcome their fear is to face it. She would bring the victims back to the ground zero of their problems. She would bring them back to the closed-down camp where this all started. It was time for them to return to Locust Lake. That day, Sarah made her way back to her office where she discovered that her number of patients had doubled. There were now four more people that had joined the group with the original four. Sarah sat down and greeted the new attendees before going through the same process she had done the previous week getting each of the four new members to introduce themselves. A short, blonde girl stood up. She was probably in her late twenties and was dressed a bit inappropriately for this kind of gathering, with a short skirt and very revealing pink tank top. 
She removed her violet-colored sunglasses and put them into her white leather purse. Hi, my name is Kimber Warren, and I came all the way out from California to be here. I thought that maybe I could, like, find some answers as to why my parents, Margaret and Kenneth Warren, had to die. Kimber spoke with a typical Valley Girl accent. Shiloh and Joe both rolled their eyes at her. They could obviously tell that she wasn't here to fix any sort of problem with herself, unless that problem was that her pockets were too empty. Next up came another woman. She was a fairly good-looking girl with dirty blonde hair that was just a bit longer than Shiloh's. She had beautiful blue eyes and wore a black blouse with blue jeans. Hi, I am Kathy. She said in a very hoarse voice that kind of took everyone back, surprising them that such a ragged voice came from such a pretty girl. My esophagus and vocal cords were damaged in the fire at Rex's bar. I was filling in for the usual bartender, and I shouldn't have been there that day. Cassie finished before sitting back down and rubbing her neck. It obviously hurt to speak, but she did it anyway. Then, an older man in an electric wheelchair rolled himself forward. He then reached and retrieved an artificial speech aid voice box from the front of his flannel shirt and pressed it against his throat. Hello, I am Garrison. I was a drowned keeper at the camp on Locust Lake. I was stabbed in the neck by a masked man. He also broke my back and paralyzed me from the waist down. He spoke in a robotic-sounding, monotone voice. Finally, there was a younger teenage girl, right around Joe's age, give or take a couple of years. Um, I'm Alyssa, and, and I was also at the camp a couple years ago. I found the camp cook in the oven, and... Alyssa began, before she was interrupted. <laughs> That's pretty ironic, Joe said jokingly which now brought him a glare from everyone else in the room. Uh, sorry, Joe said, looking down at his feet. It's, it's okay, Alyssa said, before sitting back down. Thank you for sharing, Alyssa, Sarah told her, before she eased them into her plan. Each of you have suffered a great deal, but I believe each and every one of you has the strength to overcome the events that have fallen upon you. So I believe that if you were to face your fears, you would be able to overcome them. Sarah began. How are we supposed to do that? Shiloh asked. I want to take you back to where everything started. All of your fears are like branches of a tree. A seed was planted over 30 years ago, and it branched out to affect each of you. This tree that affected all of you sprouted from Locust Lake. And I wish to take you back there. Sarah said. Hell no, Joe said. That's a bad idea. He continued. I don't know. I think it would probably help, said Natalie. I would like to go. Garrison spoke into his voice box. I agree. I think we could benefit from something like that. Raybob added. I, I don't know. Maybe. Shiloh said. Are you kidding me? Joe asked her. Don't tell me you're going to listen to this guy with three first names and an old lady and a robot. Joe then added. Hey, now. Raybob began before Sarah interrupted all of them. It will be completely optional, of course. You don't have to go if you don't want to. But I really think that you could all benefit from it. Sarah added. One by one, every one of them agreed to go on this little trip. It finally came down to Shiloh and Joe, who both reluctantly agreed. It was settled. The group of them would go up to the old camp the following weekend for a day trip. It was only one day after all, and they would be out and home before sunset. What could it hurt? A long week had passed when Sarah was finally set to drive the survivors' help group up to the camp at Locust Lake. 
Over this long weekend, she had been kept up for hours, stressing over a means to get them all up to the camp because not all of them had vehicles. She was finally able to find a rental van that was handicap accessible for Garrison. This helped a bit with her stress and her sleep, but it didn't help with her nightmares. Night after night, she had terrible dreams about the camp. She dreamt of people dying on her watch without her being able to help any of them. She dreamt of the monstrous man that she had dreamt of before. He was always chasing her, and he wasn't the only one. There was also another beast, a bit wider than the other man. He wore a black hood for a mask with stitches across the mouth and an X stitched into the left eye. During these night terrors, she always saw these monsters, but eventually she also saw another figure, a woman with pale, white skin covered in mud. She never moved, just stood there. She gave off this vibe as though she had been there for a very, very long time. She felt ancient and wise, but her visage was that of a pale corpse of a woman. Night after night, Sarah had these terrible nightmares, almost to the point where she nearly started to believe that it could be some kind of omen telling her not to take those people to that camp, but she didn't believe in that sort of thing. She knew how the human mind worked, and she knew that there was no such thing as omens or ghosts or monsters or any of that. She knew that those things just simply didn't exist. Saturday came and the group gathered at Sarah's office, where she was waiting with the van to take them all up to camp. The group of them climbed into the van, some more reluctantly than others, and they finally set off north toward their destination. After driving a good distance north, they eventually came across a turn off onto another paved road, and after a while on this paved road, they eventually turned off onto a dirt road, the road that led to the closed-down camp at Locust Lake. The camp came into sight, and it looked very familiar to the way it did in all of Sarah's dreams. It was a beautiful summer day, and everyone piled out of the van and everyone stood in silence as Garrison was lowered out of the van. They all looked around at the camp that had birthed all their fears. They all felt uncomfortable there, but seeing the camp and how peaceful it was there, it did kind of put them at ease. It was just a place like any other. After some time adjusting to the area and seeing that everyone was taking this trip fairly well, Sarah decided to take things a bit further. All right, everyone. Sarah began. I would like all of you to split up into groups of three. I would like all of you to explore the area safely and then report back here at lunchtime. All right? She continued before assigning three separate groups. Natalie, Cassie, and Ray Bob would form one group. The next would be Shiloh, Alyssa, and Joe. And finally... The last group would consist of Garrison and Kimber, who would be sticking with Sarah. Natalie, Cassie, and Raybob went off towards the cabins, toward the area where Natalie had seen her husband being torn apart years earlier. Alyssa, Shiloh, and Joe went toward the building where Alyssa had found the cook in the oven, while Garrison, Kimber, and Dr. Clark stayed close to the lake. So, Kimber, how did you hear about us all the way out in California? Sarah asked. My boyfriend, Brett, is actually from around here, which I thought was like a crazy coincidence. And his mom sent him a message on Facebook telling us about a flyer she saw. But Brett had to work, so he couldn't come. But I took a plane out here, ASAP, and... Kimber began to tell her entire story of her trip from California to Pennsylvania, but Sarah kind of tuned her out. 
Dr. Clark's attention was instead drawn across the lake, where she had seen something moving in the tall weeds at the edge. She was fixated upon this movement, and she became oblivious to the rest of the world. Dr. Clark's eyes then widened when she saw a small figure rise out of the bushes. It was a pale woman, pale as death. Thick patches of still wet mud covered her body, and her black, wet hair hung down over her face, obscuring it from view. And then, finally, we got to Philadelphia, and got a rental car, and drove up here, and here we are, and... And, hey, are you listening? Kimber finished up her story, which snapped Sarah back to reality. What? Yeah, sorry, it was just... Sarah began before looking back across the lake to find, again, a peaceful scene. No girl, just nature. Never mind. Sarah finished. The sound of an illegal hunter's gunfire rang out in the distance, causing Timber to scream in terror and take off down the road. Sarah hesitated for a moment, not wanting to leave Garrison behind, but... She eventually took off after Kimber, who was now completely out of sight. Kimber ran for her life, but in reality, she was running into her death. As she reached the road, she was struck from behind by a large chunk of burned wood, which knocked her out upon impact. Unfortunately for Kimber, someone else was able to find her before Sarah could. Kimber awoke to the putting sound of a motor that someone was attempting to start. She was still in a daze, and the back of her head stung terribly. She reached back to find a large gash in the back of her head where the piece of wood had hit her. Kimber was finally snapped completely awake when she heard the sound of a lawnmower being started, and just mere seconds later, she was grabbed by her hair and dragged away toward the sound of the engine and the spinning blades. She felt a quick jerk as her hair got caught up in the blades, and just for a moment, it seemed as though her hair would be enough to clog them. Kimber started to scream in terror, but was quickly silenced when the blades pulled again, drawing her hair in and pulling her violently backwards into the blades, where the blades cut into the back of her skull and sliced through her brain, causing her to convulse a bit on the ground before the engine finally stalled out, being unable to cut any further into the thick bone. Meanwhile, back at camp, everyone was still left exploring. None of them had even heard Kimber's scream. Cassie, Natalie, and Ray Bob were inside one of the cabins, one of the very cabins that Natalie had helped build herself. They were admiring her carpentry work, and she was reminiscing of the time she had spent building this camp with her husband, they had really done a good job. They just hadn't picked the very best of places to set up camp. I have to go to the bathroom. Cassie soon spoke. I'm afraid there probably aren't any functioning bathrooms here. Natalie told her. I'll be right back. Cassie said, unable to hold it. She ran outside and around behind the cabin, where she leaned her back against the cabin to relieve herself. When she was done... She situated herself and began back around towards the front of the cabin to rejoin Natalie and Raybob. However, she was interrupted by a sharp pain in her chest. Cassie looked down to see a blade ripping through her chest. The blade was connected to a dirty wooden pole, now soaked in blood. She watched as the blade pushed its way entirely through her chest before being twisted within her and drawn backwards through her ripping through her heart on its way back through her torso and causing her to bleed out quickly. She couldn't even scream because her throat and lungs had filled with blood. Meanwhile, Alyssa, Shiloh, and Joe had been exploring the nearby camp mess hall. Over the last few years, some teens had obviously broken into this place and spray-painted graffiti all over. Tables were smashed, chairs were broken, and the place was a mess. The trio of them soon wandered back into the kitchen area. 
Here, some beer bottles were scattered all about. Some of them were smashed, but most of them lay intact in a big pile in the corner. Alyssa scanned her eyes across the area and soon fixated them on an old, dirty oven. She stared at the oven while the images of the cook stuffed within filled her mind. Hey, are you okay? Shiloh then asked her, reaching her hand out to comfort her, but Alyssa jerked away from her. I'm sorry, I, I, I need some air, Alyssa said before quickly leaving the area and making her way outside leaving Joe and Shiloh wondering if she was all right, but they decided to give her a little space for right now. Alyssa ran outside and made her way back toward the van. She thought she would just sit in the van and chill for a while and wait for everyone to get back, but when she got to the van, she was quickly thrown against it by two powerful hands. Her head slammed against the steel door of the van and she was knocked unconscious. When Alyssa awoke a short time later, she found herself laying upon the hard, stony ground right next to the van where she had been knocked out. But now she was not beside the van, but in front of it. Alyssa struggled to get up, but when she tried to stand, her hair was pulled back. She found that her hair was now caught beneath the front driver's side tire of the van. She pulled a bit more, trying to free herself but as she attempted to do so, she then heard the engine turn over and rev up. Alyssa began to scream as the van inched forward, pulling her hair back more and more with every inch it gained. The van moved forward and Alyssa's head was pulled backward onto the hard ground. She continued to scream for help, but it was too late. The force of the wheel began to peel her scalp from her head before the van lunged forward and began to crush her skull. The pressure built within her head, which caused her eyeballs to force their way out of their sockets before her head was crushed entirely beneath the weight of the van's tire. Alyssa's screams alerted the rest of the group, whom were now all outside. They all came running. Natalie and Raybob ran down off the deck of the cabin. Sarah ran up the road where she had been looking for Kimber, and finally Shiloh and Joe came out of the woodworks and joined the group around the still-running van. Shiloh screamed at the sight of Alyssa's head crushed beneath the van, where Joe hugged her and tried to comfort her. Who the hell could have done this? Ray Bob asked. How did someone get the key to the van? Natalie asked. I, I must have left it in the van. Sarah said quietly. We trusted you. We thought it was safe to come here. Shiloh yelled at Sarah. I'm... I'm sorry. Sarah replied, nearly crying. We can talk about this later. Right now, we need to get out of here. Joe yelled, before everyone began to clamor for the van. Wait. Natalie yelled. Where is everyone else? It was at this time that they heard a loud sound pounding on wood. At first... They couldn't tell where the sound was coming from, but it was soon made clear when Sarah noticed thick black smoke bellowing out of the windows of one of the nearby cabins. Sarah quickly ran to the cabin to find that the doors had been tied shut with rope. Help! Sarah yelled as she struggled to get the ropes free from the door while Garrison was smashing his hands against the door on the other side. Does anyone have a knife? Anything? Sarah yelled again. Joe retrieved a small pocket knife from his right back pocket and quickly handed it to Sarah. Sarah cut and sawed through the ropes as fast as possible, but the pounding began to slow, and then it stopped. Sarah cut faster and faster, but when the door finally swung open, a burst of flames shot out, causing everyone to jump back. The smell of burnt flesh and plastic filled the air as everyone laid eyes upon a mass of charred flesh that was now fused to a heap of molten plastic and metal. Garrison sat in a molten pile of what used to be his wheelchair, and half-burned bodies of Kimber and Cassie lay beside him, piled one on top of the other on the floor. A few members of the group threw up, while the others scrambled back to the van. We need to get out of here, Joe said, pulling Shiloh back toward the van. 
Everyone else soon made it back to the van, and then the group of them peeled out of there and down the road out of camp. Oh my god. He's back. Mister is back. Natalie said as she began to panic in the passenger seat of the van. That's... that's impossible. Todd Jacobs is dead. Sarah said to herself as she drove down the road, trying to make sense of all this and feeling responsible for their deaths. The remaining five of them were still in a bit of shock, and none of them noticed the large, dark figure that stepped out into the road in front of them. None of them, besides Sarah, that is, who noticed the large man with the stitch-faced mask at the very last moment before she veered off the road and the van crashed violently into a tree off the side. When Shiloh woke up, Everyone else around her was motionless, and at first, she thought they were all dead. Hello? She asked quietly. This got a reaction out of Joe and Sarah, who slowly stirred and woke up, followed soon after by Raybob. Is everyone all right? Sarah asked, and everyone confirmed that they were all right. They were a little shaken up and pretty sore from the impact, but everyone was all right. Everyone aside from Natalie, that is. She was no longer in the van. Natalie! Sarah yelled out the broken window, but she got no reply. A scream then rang out from Sarah's mouth as she looked up through the cracked windshield. Natalie's body was tacked onto the tree in which they had crashed into. Two large broken branches stuck through her body, one through her chest and one through through the bottom of her stomach, pinning her onto the tree above the hood of the van. Natalie's blood trickled down off the branches and down her body, dripping down to the damaged white hood of the van. My God! Raybob then said as he saw the woman pinned to the tree. Did she go through the windshield? He then asked. No. Dr. Clark replied. The windshield is still intact. She finished. What do you mean? Then how the hell did she get up there? Raybob then blurted out. Sarah looked out the broken driver's side window, and in the distance, she could see movement in the woods. It was a pale woman, but as she approached, the mud on her became brighter and turned into a crimson hue. The mud was becoming blood. We need to go. Sarah yelled as she climbed out of the car, followed by the three remaining members of her group climbing out after her. The group of them ran away, back toward the camp and away from the thing that Sarah had seen. The four of them made it back to camp and stopped for just a moment to catch their breath. Great. We're back here. Shiloh said. Why the hell did we come back here? Joe then asked. We had to get away from her, said Sarah. Who? asked Joe. The girl in the woods, answered Sarah. What girl? I didn't see any girl, Joe told her. The girl in the woods. She was with the man with the stitch mask, Sarah said, as she looked over Shiloh's left shoulder to find a tall man dressed all in black. A wooden mask covered his face, and he held the same broken-off pole saw that she had seen in her dreams. Sarah screamed and backed away. The group of them turned and looked in the direction to which Sarah had been looking. But they didn't see anything. Raybob soon felt a wetness that was running down his chest, followed by a sharp, stinging pain that extended across his throat. He was bleeding from a large gash in his neck. His hands immediately went to cover his wounds before he dropped to the ground. Shiloh and Joe looked up at Raybob's body to find Dr. Clark gripping a bloody pocket knife, the same knife that Joe had given her. What the fuck? Joe exclaimed as Shiloh began hyperventilating from shock of realization. Dr. Clark didn't say a word. She just stared right at them, or more like right through them. It was when Dr. Clark lunged at the two of them that they took off running into the woods in the only direction they really could, 
up the mountain. They had seen an old logging road on the way to the camp, and they knew that if they could just make it up over the mountain's top, they could find this road, and with any luck, find someone who would be nearby to help them. It was around dusk time, and the sun was starting to set. Joe and Shiloh had been running uphill for several minutes before they were satisfied that they had lost Dr. Clark. What the fuck, Shy? said Joe. She killed all of them, Shiloh said, out of breath. We gotta keep going, Joe said. The two of them then waited a moment to catch their breath before hiking further up the trail. The path led up and up, and eventually opened into a wide open area. There was actually an old disused stone quarry near the small mountain's top. The path led around beside the quarry and on up over the top of the rock face. Joe and Shiloh followed the path to the top of the quarry before they had stopped to catch their breath once again. Their lungs were burning from the running all that distance uphill, but they knew that it was their best chance to escape. Shiloh began to walk again, but Joe was surprised from the woods beside him, where Dr. Clark quickly emerged and pushed Joe over the edge of the cliff. Shiloh turned just in time to see Joe slip over the edge just before watching him plummet to the jagged rocks below, where he landed with a sickening crunch. <laughs> Shiloh screamed in terror as she was hit with a new boost of adrenaline. She quickly took off running through the woods with Dr. Clark chasing right after her. Shiloh ran for several minutes before finding a bit of a clearing where the mountainside evened out a bit. The clearing was very small, only a little over a dozen feet all the way around, and there was a little bit of a mound near the far edge of the small clearing, and atop this mound was a large tree. The tree was in an odd shape. It had eight winding branches that sprung out in every direction from the tree itself, but no matter which way they had grown from originally, they all somehow managed to twist and grow in a straight line at the top that lined up perfectly with the trunk. Shiloh knew that she couldn't run anymore. Her lungs burned like fire, and she decided that she had to stand her ground. Shiloh crawled her way to the top of the small mound and hid behind the large tree to wait for Dr. Clark. Oh, Shiloh. Dr. Clark spoke in a different tone than before. Something sounded off about her. Shiloh, Shiloh. Where are you, Shiloh? Dr. Clark continued. Dr. Clark didn't step out into the clearing. Instead, she just walked around it, circling the tree within it. Dr. Clark spoke once again, as Shiloh did her best to stay out of sight, but she wasn't quick enough to move out of view and was spotted ducking back behind the tree. There you are. Come on out, Shiloh, Dr. Clark said in that same creepy tone. Shiloh stepped out from behind the tree and stared down at Dr. Clark from atop the mound, about a dozen or so feet away. Come on, Shiloh. We both know you can't run anymore. Dr. Clark spoke again. Shiloh just stood there and waited for Dr. Clark to come after her. She had a large tree branch hidden behind the tree, and she was just waiting for Dr. Clark to make her first move. But after a short while, Sarah noticed that Dr. Clark would not progress into the clearing. It was like something was keeping her just outside the edge of the area. A minute or so of silence passed as the two of them stared each other down, but then the silence was broken by a gasp that escaped Shiloh's mouth. There were now two large figures standing behind Dr. Clark. One on the left was a tall man who wore all black, his face covered by a wooden mask with a strange smile carved into it, and beside him stood a very familiar face. It was the man with the stitchwork mask, the man that had haunted her dreams for all these years. Dr. Clark then turned to look at the beasts behind her before looking back at Shiloh. You see them too? 
were Sarah's last words. Before the two large men pulled her back into the darkness of the forest, her screams echoed and faded into the night, and Shiloh was left alone beside the large tree in the darkness. Hello? Shiloh heard a man's voice. Hello? Shiloh heard the voice again. Shiloh snapped awake and began to fight off the man that was trying to wake her up. She soon calmed down as she scanned the tree line and realized that she was safe. She must have passed out from exhaustion the night before, and now a logger had found her leaning against a tree. She was safe, but she knew it wasn't over. She knew there were still monsters out there. That just goes to show you, just because you got away, doesn't mean you got away. For if something truly evil has touched you, you can be rest assured it will follow wherever you may go. So, no sense in going too far, and remember to stop by again next weekend. Until then, remember to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again next Saturday. <laughs>